So welcome back to another episode of the Business That Matter Spotlight. My name is Warren Coughlin. I'm your host. And for those of you who don't know, I live in Toronto, Canada. And historically, February in Toronto is a little cold. And there are piles of snow lining the roads and weighing down trees. On fe- February 10th this year, I went out for a long mountain bike ride in the woods next to running rivers and hard packed dirt. Now, I do know there's a big difference between atypical weather and climate, but most people in this part of the world and elsewhere are starting to get convinced that things, maybe they be a change. Uh, And so for many business people, the question of what we can do to help is being asked more frequently. And today's guest is going to help us answer the, give us the answer to those questions or not the answer, but will help us answer those questions. Bob Willard is an author, speaker, founder of Sustainability Advantage, helping organizations understand the challenge and what they can do about it. Bob, welcome to the spotlight. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I've been I've been looking forward to it all week. Um, now, as you know, at, on the spotlight, we like to uh, just help people who maybe can't hang out for the entire length of the podcast. So I always like to start off with some first bit of advice. Um, so if you were to tell someone who's young or even advanced, you know, but they want to, they want to start making a difference in the world through their business, what would you say? That's a great question. Uh, I think credibility is really, really high uh, with people that know what they're talking about. And building trust is important for people to listen to what your advice might be. So I think it's really helpful if young people understand that they need to get good at something. Um, either how to report on this stuff or how to how to calculate the benefits or whatever uh the passion these days doesn't carry the the argument just uh, pleading with people to do the right thing uh, of course they want to do the right thing but in many cases they think they can't afford it uh so uh i think it's up to us as change agents to be uh more capable of meeting them where they are and helping them uh, see benefits that perhaps they hadn't anticipated before or included in their own uh, mental model of what it takes to be able to improve their impacts on people and planet. And a change agent is any basically anybody who wants to be a change agent. You don't have to yeah. be designated as such or to be put in a position to do that, right? Exactly. It's people that care about something, that, that are trying to get other people to care enough about the same things so that they... Uh, do things differently or stop doing some things that perhaps they're already doing. Uh, So yeah, change agent's just a fancy name for someone that cares about uh, an issue and is trying to engage others in in addressing that issue. Now, I do want to get into hearing about sustainability advantage, what it does and all those kinds of things. Normally I start with that about the business, (laughs) Um, but you're kind of got an interesting background. You didn't grow up as a, uh, you know, card carrying environmentalist. Uh, you started out in IBM. So I just like to track through a little bit of what your what your background was and what your trajectory to this line of work and thinking was. Yeah, I must admit that I'm uh, I'm a sort of a latecomer to all of this stuff. I couldn't spell sustainability in the in the nineteen nineties, and uh, even if I could, I didn't care about it. Uh, but in the uh, the mid nineteen nineties, there were some issues with a water plant in Ajax where I was living at that time that we thought was, some of us anyway, thought was a little too close to the Pickering Nuclear Generation Station. Um, So we wanted the water plant moved from where it was and the construction of a new one to be further away from the the power plant. Um, That didn't work. Uh, We spent three years trying to get uh, the town and the region and the province to move the thing, and it, it didn't work. Um, but it was a real, real wake up call for me because I, I always assumed, probably naively, uh, that the people who are supposed to be looking after us were looking after us, uh, that they were making the right decisions based on the, the kind of information that scientists said was available. Um, and that that faith was unfortunately um, shattered by that whole process. Uh, I was firmly convinced that the amount of radioactive tritium in our drinking water that was coming from that current uh, water plant, water treatment plant, um, could be a problem over time. Not not that we get a big dose of it, but it's a little trickle and it yeah. has a bad impact on people. Anyway. Um, 
That experience was a bit of an eye opener for me. And I was partway through a master's degree at the University of Toronto, a part time while I was still at IBM in leadership development. And um, I decided to finish that master's with credits at the Faculty of Environmental Studies. No, I'm sorry, and, was, your, was your master's in leadership development or was your role at IBM in leadership development? My role at IBM was in leadership development and my master's was actually in uh, about learning organizations, which the University of Toronto had a special set of uh, courses on. Uh, and I took all those courses and then I needed a few more. So I thought, OK, well, I, I guess I could take some other ones like the environmental ones, which counted as well. So um, I took those courses and it was really depressing. I mean, I had no idea the uh, the issues that we are facing as uh, humankind. And I thought, hey, we've got to fix this. I've got kids, um, soon to have grandkids. And uh, I thought, hmm, all right, if we're going to fix this, governments can't do it on their own. They're going to have to engage businesses to help them. Uh, but businesses won't do anything unless there's something in it for them. That means they need a business case to do that. So what is the business case for uh, improving our impacts on people and planet? So that was my master's thesis, the business case for sustainability. Um, and after I took retirement at, um, in the year 2000, um, I decided to convert my master's thesis to a, a book called The Sustainability Advantage. And then one thing led to another. I, I, wrote a bunch of other books as well. But the wake up call came from that water plant experience. And um, frankly, until then, I was totally oblivious, disinterested in uh, all of this stuff. Uh, and then I realized that this was serious and that we needed to be more uh, capable of engaging people with power, influence and smarts um, to help us fix these things. And so then the book, I take it like a lot of authors that serve as a platform for you. Um, like how well, so a couple of things, like what you did it as a master's thesis and then converted it into a book. Um, what did you learn about publishing a book, which would be quite different from submitting a thesis, I would suspect? Yeah, I just lucked out. There were a couple of people that I knew that were uh, authors already, and they were good enough to connect me with their publisher, New Society Publishers on the West Coast in uh, British Columbia, uh, who are amazing. And it turned out when I sorted the books that I had been using in my research and so on by uh, publisher, turned out that they had published a fair number of the books that I had used. Uh, so I connected with them and they were wonderfully gracious and gave me a chance to make a proposal to them. and. Um, uh, they became my publisher. So I was just dumb lucky uh, mm -hmm. to be able to make those connections. But um, the, the fact is, the, the reason I wrote the book is <laughs> when I retired, I didn't know what to do with myself. I I, uh, I don't golf. So I, th I thought, well, okay, well, what am I going to do? So I thought, well, what the heck? My advisor had suggested I create a book out of the thesis. So I did that. And then I didn't know what to do with myself. The, the book was done. Then what? Uh, and I thought, well, you know, maybe a few people would like to hear about it. Uh, so by the time you hear about a conference, the agenda is normally pretty well set. But I did a, a maybe 20 or 22 uh, talks that first year, um, uh, mostly on my own dime, getting to locations all over the place uh, that were in conferences. And then I started to pick up the pace a bit and, and started to do more talks and um I've, I've done over 1,700 talks now on, on sustainability-related issues and the business relevance of all of those things, uh, most of them for free. Um, but uh, I think that's the way I can contribute to the momentum around all of this, is to help others understand the issues well enough to be able to do something about them and provide them a bunch of resources. I've got over a dozen free open source tools on my website that help people be more effective uh, when they are talking to businesses about issues that may be a little bit new to their business. And what's the what's been the appetite? You know, so you, you've been doing this. It sounds so you're you're 23 years post retirement, which a, you know, hooray, that's quite amazing to be so passionate about something 24 years after retirement. Um, and I imagine there there's been a change in the market from 
the people who want to hear this story, the number of people who want to hear this story and why they want to hear the story? Like, can you just track that, what you've observed as the change? Yeah, initially, a lot of the talks I gave were to non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, who were having conferences on this stuff, or to environmental classes in colleges and universities around the world. Um, but it, lately, uh, most of my talks have been to business schools. This has become a business issue. This is a legitimate business concern, much of it driven, unfortunately, by uh, concerns about climate change. So climate change is a lightning rod in the business community for uh, all things sustainable. Uh, so they're very concerned about the impact of climate on the business, and they're being pressured to do more to ensure that the business is not creating problems that are going to aggravate the climate change crisis by not reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So uh, the business readiness for this discussion is significantly higher than it used to be. And, do you think, um, and is that, um, I don't know, I know it's not a, an all or nothing, but is there, what's the shift been between, if any, um, doing this because there's probably some regulatory regime coming and it'd be better to get ahead of it or damn it, this is an existential risk for humanity and I want to be part of solving it. Well, as you might expect, it's more the former than the latter. Uh, it's still being driven by um, avoiding risks. I'd like to say it's also being driven by capturing opportunities, but if I was to weigh those two reasons that usually a company does anything, avoid risk or capture opportunities, the risk one is still higher than mm -hmm. capturing opportunities. They're concerned about regulations that are coming, um, usually as, as usual, coming out of Europe first on what companies could or should be reporting on annually in terms of not only how they are impacting people and planet with their own operations, but what's happening in their supply chains and holding them accountable for what's happening in their supply chains. So the dynamics around all of this are still uh, being driven by either regular, regulatory agencies or important stakeholders. And when I say important stakeholders in a capitalistic system, important stakeholders are providers of capital. Mm -hmm. So banks, investors, even insurers, um, big buyers, big customers who provide not so much capital, but revenue, money, um, follow the money. Uh, the, the people, investors don't want to put their company, their, their money into a company that's risky. And there's a lot of concern these days that businesses are not ready for climate change and they could get wiped out directly or indirectly by the impacts of climate change. And of those, of those three, the uh, banks, uh, investors, and insurers, who's applying the most pressure right now? I know that like banks and, and investors have more capital at play, but I wonder whether the insurers, because they're going to be the ones that are forking over the cash, whether they're, which one is actually coming to the line first saying, get your stuff together. Yeah, you'd think that insurers and, and reinsurers would be all over this. Mm -hmm. You'd think they would have been doing this for years. They are probably the least involved of all of them. Isn't that uh, interesting? Banker, bankers, some of them have sustainability linked loans. So they're putting their money where their mouth is and, and saying that, okay, if, if you're a better risk, we'll give you a bit of a break on administration fees for a loan or uh, the rate of the loan. Um, but investors are probably the ones that are getting the most press these days. So you get stock exchanges that are requiring companies to be more forthright in their disclosures of how they're doing on sustainability related issues, especially greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, so the SEC in the US and the CSA in Canada are, are looking at putting in requirements that companies when they are filing their annual update to their um, uh, Form 10K or whatever it is that they, that they do, uh, they um, include how they are uh, signing up for and committed to science-based targets. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So you get a stock exchange asking that question, it's, it gets a little bit more attention as a question than if a tree hugger asked that question. You know That's what I mean? Yeah. So 
yeah. you get the the big guys asking that question. But the 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 um, the horse that I'm riding these days is not so much the investor insurer banker horses; it's the buyer horses. That is to say, the the companies or governments that are procuring things, and they're going to ask their suppliers how things are going on these issues in those companies and give preferential treatment to the companies that are doing the most or the best on things like reducing the greenhouse gases or the way they treat their employees or whatever. And that's, that's an incremental. It's interesting you say that. I, w- I just had a conversation with somebody a couple hours ago um, and we were talking about his supply chain because he's a guy who wants to do uh, sustainable business practices and he uses outsourced fulfillment and in the jurisdictions in which he operates, there are no fulfillment houses that are using green business practices. Right, right. So he's he's doing it incrementally through, okay, who has the right culture alignment and who's sort of moving in that direction. But it's one of the things I've been talking to a lot of people about is the purity, the purity test that everything you do must line up is kind of impossible when the existing supply chains, infrastructures, just don't have it installed yet. Exactly. And they haven't been asked to either. There is a report by an organization called CDP a couple of years ago, actually it was last year, um, that said that only about 3% of the buyers are asking their suppliers anything about their greenhouse gas emissions or climate change. Really? Uh, So when you're trying to get a little bit of momentum building in the supply chain on this issue, and the reduction of greenhouse gases, it kind of helps to have at least a question being asked as to how you're doing on all of this stuff. And it turns out that actually 0.04% are are asking whether the supplier is committed to science-based targets, which is reducing their greenhouse gases all the way to net zero by 2050 and halfway there by 2030. So um, if you don't have those questions coming, the buying power is not being used to influence uh, and engage uh, suppliers. Although at the federal level, to to be fair, the federal government of Canada, as of April last year, uh, requires all their major suppliers, uh, suppliers that do more than $25 million worth of business a year with the federal government, all the major suppliers, and there are about 800 of them, to sign up for the net zero challenge in Canada, which requires them to uh, reduce their greenhouse gases by uh, 100% by 2050 and halfway there by 2030. Otherwise, they don't get to be a supplier. That's a pretty strong message. What I'm encouraging the federal government to do is to take that same approach and ask small and medium-sized suppliers, not just the big guys, but all of them, um, how committed they are to uh, science-based targets, reducing their greenhouse gases down to science-based targets. And um, not so much that they, if they don't, then they won't be allowed to be a supplier, but give them a score as to how committed they are, how ambitious they are on those targets, and then make that score matter. In other words, have a lot of points in the bid appraisal that are associated with the score on that particular little questionnaire and, and make it matter. And if, if nobody is doing anything on it, then they're all going to get zero. So it doesn't matter. But all of a sudden, they start to realize, oh, if I want to get a lot of points on this, I, I just need to improve my commitment to reducing my greenhouse gases. Now, you mentioned, so we've been talking a little bit about, you know, pressure and things like that. But you you started and your book began with, you know, the sustainability advantage, which is there are business benefits. And I, I believe you said there's seven business benefits for pursuing sustainability. Can you, without without reciting your thesis, uh, <laughs> you know, can you give like a quick highlight of what those seven business benefits are? Absolutely. Well, the, the one that most people think of is what I call a low-hanging fruit. It's being able to save money on four things. Your energy bill, your water bill, your waste bill, and your materials bill. And of those four things, the easiest one is energy. It's, it's the fastest way to save my energy efficiencies and then converting to renewable energy, which is cheaper in many cases than non-renewable energy in most of the world these days. The yeah, price I, of I, I, solar I, I, and wind I power. I want to stop you on that one because that, 
I had a conversation with a friend recently and I said that to him and he was shocked until he went and researched it. So for the most part, renewable energy is cost competitive, if not cost advantageous to traditional forms of energy. Is that true? Yes. Yes. The, the, uh, the net cost of wind, especially uh, onshore wind as, as opposed to offshore wind, and uh, solar panels, solar energy, uh, has dropped like a stone in the last 10 years. And so it's, it's definitely cheaper than, uh, well, way cheaper than nuclear. Nuclear is the most expensive energy on the planet. Um, the uh, cost is almost equal to gas in most locations, certainly cheaper than coal. Uh, so it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> you never know it from the way Ontario is behaving, but absolutely, it, it is the best alternative for energy. Um, as so anyway, okay, the, so those are, those are four of the seven. So, so no, actually, it's just one saving oh, money, saving okay. money, so saving money on utilities, energy, water, material, and waste. Um, the second big one is revenue opportunity to make more money because people are looking for these kinds of things, and that gets into the procurement argument we just had that mm -hmm. if you're going to be able to capture more business, uh, because your customers are starting to look for. Um, not only sustainable products, but also companies that are producing them that are doing the right things as well. Why? Because those companies are getting a lot of heat from their stakeholders to, to do more uh, on these issues. So more revenue, save money, increase the productivity of your employees. Uh, because when you, when you start to do this and make it clear to your employees that you're, you're caring about this stuff, it resonates with their values. This gets into the B Corp stuff, but frankly, people are really genuinely concerned about it. And if they can see that their company, their company is the agent of change, is driving these kinds of behaviors in the business community, uh, then this magic happens. And in fact, that, that's really the secret sauce in the whole business case. Get your employees engaged and they will figure this out. They will figure out how to save money, make money, um, attract more people, so that's that's attract uh, talent. Avoid risk uh, is is another one of the the benefits because all of those things are going to go up in price, mm -hmm. the energy, water, material, and waste. And if you can find efficiencies and start to reduce those things in a circular economy and all that good stuff, then you can um, really avoid a lot of risk. So avoiding risk, making more money, saving money on energy, water, material, and waste, energizing your employee, being more attractive so that as an employer, so that you're going to have less attrition of your good people, which is extremely expensive, especially in um, services uh, organizations. So th that's basically what it's all about. And it's, um, it's having a more comprehensive business case and making sure that um, that you are including all of those factors when you're making a decision as to whether you're going to do something or not. Cost of capital can go down as well for organizations that are more attractive to investors. So, so when you are advancing this in an organization, like who's the who's the primary change agent on the business case? Is it the CEO? Is it the CFO? Is it a COO? Or is it even at the C level? It's the CFO. CFO? Absolutely. If the CFO thinks it's a good idea, the CEO will think it's a good idea, but not necessarily the other way around. Mm -hmm. The CFO uh, is wonderfully hard-nosed, trying to make damn sure the business does the right things with the little amount of discretionary capital that it has at its disposal. Um, so those of us that care about this need to be smarter at um, understanding how they expect this ask to be framed. Um, and the cost benefit analysis that's been used uh, for years by CFOs is, is unfortunately not well known by um, most sustainability champions or change agents. So a lot of what I do is try to help them get comfortable using a, a cost benefit analysis form, um, enhance the way the CFO leadership network thinks it should be enhanced, um, and make it sure that it's a comprehensive one that includes all the factors that I just talked about, plus the factor that says 
how does this project help us fulfill our purpose? Mm -hmm. And I think the world is a little bit more ready for that criteria to be legitimized as part of the uh, set of criteria that we look at when we're making decisions as a business. How does this project align or help us fulfill our purpose? Now, when you when you are tight, so I'm going to pick up on two things in there. One, when, when you said uh, you've been trying to help others in the sustainability world uh, understand this argument. What's their response to it? Like, is it? Did they get that? No, this is a this is a really good way of framing it so that we're accepted. Or do you get the no, no? They have to be doing it because it's the right thing to do and it's a moral obligation uh, and it's somehow um, tarnishing us if we try to present this in business terms as opposed to ethical or moral terms. Yeah, you're you're quite right. They're understandably a little ticked that they have to talk this kind of language to uh, to anybody. Why don't they just do it for the right reasons? And for those of us that care about it, it's a no brainer to do it for the right reasons. But people who are accountable to other people in the organization for the use of the resources of the company need to be able to justify it internally to their colleagues. So they need to be able to um, be so excited about this project that maybe they would champion it because they think it's really, really good for the company, mm -hmm. for that company, as well as for the causes that we are espousing. So the um, the first reaction is, damn, I, I don't want to I don't want to use this kind of business case stuff, this cost benefit analysis. But I said, well, it depends on whether you want to be effective or not. <laughs> so you know, if you just want to vent, go for it. But if you want to be an effective change agent, get with the program, meet these people where they are, use their form to present your case, and uh, you'll be surprised. In fact, I, I remember I was in Seattle doing a talk. They're doing a whole bunch of talks actually a few years ago and i was asked to meet with a green team that was being uh, regularly um, dismissed by the cfo every time they they approached the cfo with an idea that they thought would be good for the company to undertake and the, gr the green team was basically asking for energy saving and water saving and waste savings kinds of projects and it's just a bunch of well-meaning employees uh, and they would go ask the the uh, CFO for some money to support their initiatives. And the CFO would basically say, no, no, not a whole lot of rationale. But anyway, they they, they were very frustrated. So uh, they asked me to come and have a chat with the CFO, <laughs> uh, which I did. Um, uh, it was supposed to be a half day with the guy. And it turned out that he got busy and, and it got shrunk to a a quarter of a day and then he got busier and they got shrunk to a coffee meeting um, which is your first clue that this is not pretty high on this guy's agenda right. so anyway um so i said <laughs> i remember the conversation i i, I said so uh, look um you're the cfo and um your job is to make sure that the company doesn't do anything stupid with its money he said well i i don't know if, i don't know if i'd quite phrase it that way but uh we do have to be careful about the limited amount of capital that we have at our disposal and we need to use it well. I said, absolutely. And that's your job and, and good for you. That, that's exactly what you should do. I said, I also hear you don't really care that much about sustainability. And the green team standing right beside me. Uh, so they said, well, <clears throat> I, 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 I guess I just don't understand it very well, but I, I just don't see how the, what these folks are asking me to do is it, gonna be good for the company. I said, absolutely. Yeah. You don't think it's going to be good for the company? You should not approve it. So I said, let's suppose there were three companies, three, three projects coming forward from different parts of the organization looking for uh, about the same amount of capital. And you've only got that much capital. How do you decide which project gets it? How do you make that decision? I said, oh, that's pretty straightforward. We take a look at their CapEx form and, and whoever's got the best ROI is the one that gets it, the faster payback period. And I said, the what form? He said, the CapEx form, the capital expenditure request form. That's what we use for all of these projects. So I turned to the green team and I said, have you ever heard of that form? Hmm. Had never heard <laughs> of the form. So I asked the CFO, would you mind giving us a copy of that so we can just take a look at it and maybe take one of the projects that these these folks are um, 
keen on and uh, fill it in. So, oh, happy to. Goes ripping off to his office, comes back 30 seconds later. It's a one page form. I mean, it's, it's really not that tricky. Uh, so he left it with us and we spent the morning fill, taking all of their numbers and putting it into his form. He came back at noon. Uh, gave us some really good ideas, actually, uh, good thoughts on, on how to be, use it more effectively. Uh, I had to leave. He had to leave. Um, and by three o'clock that afternoon, the, the team had finished their proposal, went to the CFO. He approved the project. Wow. Same, same project that he yeah. had rejected about a month before. His form, their numbers, but his form. We have to learn to talk to people in their language using their way of making decisions and that's just not about sustainability that's that's basic sales isn't it yeah i mean i used to teach sales school it, it's a it's a no-brainer meet them where they are talk their language honor their processes and make darn sure your proposal fits in their processes now let's let's just shift a little bit i love that and i it's one of the things in my discussions with people in these areas i've i've <laughs> gotten myself into some trouble on but i've tried to say that kind of thing like you got to speak to them in a way that they understand to try to you know if you're trying to evangelize them into your way of thinking it's just going to take longer if you can frame your stuff in their value set you're more likely to get a yes and it's it's a version of extreme ownership you know you yeah. can complain or you can get results and, and, and the important thing here is not so much that you're using their form, but you're showing respect for that person. You're building trust. You're building a relationship because you're going to be back. And at some point, you may have that evangelistic kind of conversation with the person, but you've earned the right to have that conversation. You have established a foundation of respect, mutual respect, hopefully, and they understand that they're not trying to do something bad for the company. You're actually you're trying to do something good for the company. And the way you express what that good is needs to be framed in a way that they agree. So um, I, I I remember having a conversation with Amory Lovins. I, I don't know if you know Amory Lovins, but Amory Lovins is one of the top five gurus and all of this stuff in the world. He, he set up, um, uh, what's it called, RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute. Oh, yeah. um, Anyway, I was interviewing him. <laughs> I was interviewing him for one of my books. And uh, <laughs> the only time I could have any time with him at all, he was in Toronto doing a bunch of talks. And, and uh, I said, OK, tell you what, um, I will drive you to the airport and I'll give you a tape recorder and I give you, I'll give you a list of five questions. And um, if you could just talk into the mic and the, and the tape recorder, uh, I'll, I'll drive and I'll, get, I'll take you to the airport. So this will be my interview with you. He said, oh, sure, fine. Great guy. So I, st I said, just before you start, um, what do you call this stuff? I call it sustainability. What, what do you call it? Long pause. He said, well, <clears throat> I never use the S word. Which is <laughs> sustainability. I thought, oh, damn. So uh, I got used to sustainability all over the place. You know, sustainability advantage is the name of my, is in my titles. And well, anyway, so I said, oh, okay. So, so what do you call it? He said, well, I call it whatever they want to call it. They want to talk about water. We talk about water. We talk about trees. If they want to talk about trees, it, it, it depends on what they want to call it. They want to talk about waste. We talk about waste. He said, uh, whatever they think is, is an important issue within all of this stuff, that's what we call it. And then later on, when we have a chance to have a little more uh, in-depth conversation, we may extend it into some other areas as well. But we start with what they think is important and what they call it is fine. And then we just go from there. So the jargon that we sometimes insist that they use when they're describing what they want to do I think we need to kind of back off and, and just kind of get beneath the terminology and understand what they're trying to do and then build on that as something which can be the platform for doing more in related issues. Yeah, I agree. I think in social activism generally, there's too much attachment to particular terminology and not to the results. Yeah, we keep correcting people. You know, you're, you're using, you, 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 why are you using ESG when you're talking about sustainability or CSR or whatever? I mean, God. Now, I've, 
I've looked into like some of the certifications and documents and processes that have been that are out there. They're popular. They're created for large organizations. I work with small businesses. Most of the people listening to this are small businesses. And candidly, they just they don't have the resources of time, team and money to take those on. You need like a whole organization and team to complete those processes to get validation. Um, so if there's a small business owner who's listening to this, and I know a lot of them, they like they care about it. But, you know, I'm running at 17% net margins and my receptionist has a kid who's sick, so I want to give her a raise next week. Um, like these are the real world decision makings that small business owners make. Um, how do they enter into this conversation? Yeah, because a lot of the tools that we have are not designed for them. They're designed for large companies that have expertise on staff that are able to produce the reports and do the business cases and all that kind of stuff. So um, the reality is that 99.8% of the companies in Canada are small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. 0.2% are the large companies that all of these tools were designed for. Mm -hmm. If we drop it down to 100 employees or less, it's, a, it's 98% of the companies in Canada, 98.1% of the companies in Canada, the US, Europe, the world are small companies. They don't have the resources. So we need tools for them. So that's what I've spent a few years creating. So I have taken the tools that the big guys use, looked at all of them and what it is they're asking about and come up with very simple ways of small and medium-sized enterprises basically self-assessing themselves using those um, uh, the tools that I've created, free open source tools. So I've got something called the Basic Sustainability Assessment Tool, BSAT, Basic Sustainability Assessment Tool. It's only 20 multiple choice questions. By the time that that's finished, you can see how you're doing on all of the core things that all of the other questionnaires ask about. There are only 18 of them. Um, and and that, that's a good starter set. And it's dead simple. You can finish it. And if you got the information, you can finish it in half an hour. Uh, but the good news is that probably you don't have all the information. So you have to work with others to fill that out. You and I know that there's a, there's a B Corp business impact assessment, which is intended also for small and medium sized enterprises. But you need to be really into this, really wanting to do it, to mm -hmm. go through those questions because they are pretty rigorous. And I'm on the B Corp Standards Advisory Council, and I totally understand all of that. Um, but man, there are hundreds of questions. So uh, my tool is intended to benefit from all of what those other ones ask, but also ask in a way that is more reasonable for a small and medium-sized enterprise. So that there are other tools as well, but I totally agree with you that we need to ensure that the smaller enterprises that don't have a lot of expertise on this are going to be able to uh, benefit from the kind of analysis that that can be done with these tools and then decide what they want to improve well that's the next piece look so like even if they do the analysis then there's like are there are there tools or resources that would just help me like i i don't know how to change my power supply i'm not sure where to enter a procurement are there how do i ask my supplier to disclose what their green policies are can i do that can i ask them that can i put that in a contract like there's these are all these kind of questions that a small business owner has never been in this is going to go this just seems overwhelming yeah it, it, at first glance it is but um i've got toolkits that are designed for small and medium-sized enterprises as well on the procurement side on the assessment side, on the justification side. Um, and then, God, there are hundreds of uh, tools out there. Once you decide to do something and you want to figure out how to do it, wonderful uh, assistance out there. Um, man, there, the, in fact, I've got one of my tools which asks uh, a small and medium sized enterprise, I think it's five questions, maybe seven questions, on uh, how committed it is to reducing their greenhouse gases. At the end of that, there is a, an action worksheet, which has got over three dozen suggestions on, uh, okay, if you wanna reduce your greenhouse gases, your scope one, your scope two, your scope three, the direct and indirect uh, greenhouse gases, here are a whole bunch of ways to do that. So, you know, it's, it's not for lack of technique. We, we know exactly, it's the decision to do it. 
Mm -hmm. That's the important part. And then finding, so where can people find this? Because I know there's there's two things. Some, some small business owners are going to say, well, I'm just a small business. I'm just a drop in the bucket. It doesn't matter. But you were sharing with me previously that something like, what is it, 42% of greenhouse gases are from SMEs? Yes. Like that's 42% a, of the, uh, in Canada, uh, the Business Development Corporation, BDC, um, did a study that showed that 42% of the emissions coming from business in Canada um, are from small and medium-sized enterprises. And half of them, to their credit, do have plans to reduce the greenhouse gases. Another 18% are thinking about having plans, so they have good intentions. Uh, but there's over 30%, I think it's 32%, that uh, have no plans to reduce the greenhouse gases. And if they have no plans, we're not going to make it. Right. So we need to figure out ways of incenting them to do that and uh, some of the sustainable procurement approaches and net zero procurement approaches that I'm encouraging companies to use will provide that incentive. And so where can people find, find some of these resources? You've got some of them on your site, is that right? Yeah, so the name of my, <laughs> it's not a, it doesn't trip right off the tongue, but sustainabilityadvantage.com. So sustainabilityadvantage.com is my website. All, all of the tools, there's a, um, set of buttons at the top and you click on those, you'll see all the tools. Uh, the main page describes all those tools and um, they're free. They're, they're free, they're open source, they're in Excel, so most people are comfortable with them. Um, and I really encourage people to use them as a base for whatever they want to do. I mean, the, the fact that they're open source means you can tailor them to whatever uh, purposes you, you want them to be. But uh, they're based on the best of the best uh, that I used as sources for a lot of the things that I put into those tools. And you mentioned that you're you're working quite intensely around uh, net zero procurement, uh, both with companies and with with government. Uh, with government, I imagine there's a certain amount of um, institutional inertia there. Uh, okay. Is there is there any organization like if people are listening to this saying, "Yeah, I'd really like to help with that because that's an important thing." Um, are you involved in anything or are there places where entrepreneurs can participate to support that? Yeah, it really depends on, on the circle of influence that these folks can, can um, um, energize to do something. I, I encourage them to talk to their local municipalities about, you know, what they're doing on the procurement front. Um, and I think they might be pleasantly surprised that, that most municipalities in Canada really do care about this stuff. Um, there is the something called the are actually more advanced than the, than the feds and provinces are in many ways, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, although there's there are some good things happening in British Columbia on procurement as well. Uh, and at the federal level, to be fair, it, it's not that they don't care about this stuff. It's just that they've got so much stuff that they're trying to do. Um, so I'm trying to make this as simple and packaged as possible so that the implementation of it is going to be... Um, uh, a reasonable request and that they can try it out first of all with some suppliers and then go from there but i really think that with the climate crisis we know we need to ratchet up the sense of urgency we don't have forever to figure this out we, we need to ask suppliers how's it going on this stuff how committed are you and give them a fair number of points in the bid appraisal uh if they are more committed than their competitors nice Thank you shared a ton of information. This has been an unusual version of the podcast for us because this is more about a really important issue out there and what people can do about it. Um, but I just always like to end uh, end these with a couple of rapid fire questions for you personally. All right. Uh, what's one decision or action that most helped you get where you are? Deciding that I was going to walk the talk and reduce my own greenhouse gases to zero. And have you done that? Yep. Congratulations, that's awesome. I was the first company in Canada in the net zero challenge to reach the diamond level, which is the the, the level you reach when you've done that. And was it, I just, a side note, this was supposed to be rapid fire, but how was it tough to achieve that or is it? No, nope, I've already done it. I, I had decided in 2005 to, to start doing that. And um, I did specific things. But the decision to do that was the, the, the main thing. I was determined that I was going to get down to net zero. And uh, I figured out how to do that. And I did it. Awesome. 
one personal quality that you most had to improve or overcome? Um, impatience. Mm. We need to be better at being patiently aggressive on these things. Uh, the more you feel a sense of urgency, the more strident you, you tend to become. And that's not good because people shy away from those those kinds of approaches. So giving people an opportunity to engage in this in a way that works for them, and it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And what's one personal quality that most contributed to your success? Perseverance. This is way too important to walk away from. This is really, really important. And I'm not gonna quit till we fix it. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really great, con and you know, what, what you shared, even though it's been in the sustainability conversation, are principles that are more of general application. You know, having a purpose, having a vision, um, speaking to your stakeholders in the, in the language that resonates with them, being persistent and diligent and creative in your execution. It almost doesn't matter what your vision is. Those are the those are qualities that are going to help you get there. So I really I appreciate you sharing that with us today. That's a great summary of a book that I wrote called The Sustainability Champions Guidebook, which is how to lead change. What you just rhymed off are a whole bunch of the things that I have under leadership practices. I don't need to read the book then. <laughs> That's right. You could have written it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure, Bob. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity.